Well, welcome to today's video update. You are most welcome. It's Thursday, the 23rd of April already. It seems to be going really quick for some reason. So this morning we're going to have a, a look at the various uh, countries around the world and, and what's happening at some various places of interest. And I've also got a, an interesting study on the numbers from China that shows that the initial numbers in China were indeed inaccurate. And as time goes, we'll, um, we'll see how time goes. But I've also got an interesting study on children from China as well, which is fairly good news, I think it has to be said. But of course, uh, 23rd of April to the 23rd of May. So if you're a Muslim watching, you'll realise the significance of that. It's Ramadan. Now, in the UK, the mosques are closed for Ramadan, as are all places of worship. So I would imagine that's the same in, in many parts of the world. So lots of people are having virtual ifars, the celebratory meal at the end of the day after, after abstaining from food and drink for the day. Now, um, one of the concerns here is, is about the risk groups. Now, um, UK high risk groups have been advised uh, by Islamic authorities not to fast, which I must say I agree with. Now, the ones that would be partic particular concern to me if you, if you are a Muslim and watching around the world. Um, diabetes, of course, is a classic one, especially if a, a diabetic is on insulin, where they have to titrate what they're eating with the amount of insulin. So possibilities for hypoglycemias there um, if it's not well managed. And the other one that's perhaps most concerning to me really is the dehydration issue. Um, because we know that uh, dehydration doesn't help the mucociliary clearance system. So um, dehydration could be a bit of a problem for people that are susceptible to chest infections, especially. Now, the other group that concerns me is, is when people are actually ill with COVID-19, they're probably going to be fairly anorexic anyway. They're not going to want to eat too much. But in convalescence, the body also needs more protein and more carbohydrates to recover from the disease process. So um, people that are convalescing would want to consult with their Islamic authorities and consider not fasting uh, this year. And of course, pregnancy, which is already covered in, uh, in Islamic guidelines. So uh, a few interesting things there just to consider during, during Ramadan. Now, um, globally, um, over two and a half million confirmed cases, 180 4,000 uh, confirmed deaths and we'll see one reason why this number is definitely absolutely lower. Uh, this is this number is too low, the real number is higher as we look at some cases from uh, China. Now uh, just quick review first of the US. Uh, this really is a huge disease epicenter, there's no question about that. Um, a million cases can't be too far away now unfortunately in the United States. 46,785 confirmed deaths attributed to, to COVID-19. Now, Robert Redfield is the director for the American Center for Disease Control, I believe. And he thinks there could be cases in the fall, what we call autumn time in England. Now, this means that there could be cases all through summer and into the fall autumn time when the weather starts getting a bit uh, colder again. And the problem is in the fall and winter time, there's cases of seasonal influenza, huge numbers of seasonal influenza cases. And what we don't want is people to be getting COVID-19 and influenza at the same time, because we believe that's associated with a remarkably poor prognosis. So getting influenza on its own is one thing, getting COVID-19 on its own is, is one thing, but getting both at the same time. And if there's COVID-19 endemic in an area at the same time that seasonal influenza is endemic, then there's absolutely no reason why someone shouldn't get both viral infections at the same time. And that is very concerning and could be very dangerous and could massively increase the case fatality rate. Now, hopefully, over the next few months, we'll get a definitive answer from national authorities as to whether influenza vaccination will be advised. 
and whether influenza vaccine is is good in COVID-19 or not, because at the moment there's there's some contradictory advice on that. So it's not an immediate problem because we're not really in flu vaccination season yet by any means. We're just coming to the end of the uh, 2020 flu season. But for the 2020-2021 flu season, hopefully we'll have definitive guidelines in place. But this is a major concern that there will be ongoing cases into the next influenza season. And we know the next influenza season is going to happen. It always does. It's guaranteed to happen. It's just a case of how big it is. And if there's any particular, uh, particularly new influenza viruses. Now, the United States first confirmed deaths have now been pushed back to the 6th and 7th of February. This is in the Bay Area in California. So um, we now know that the first death in the United States was no later than the 6th of February. So someone died of COVID-19 in the Bay Area, California, 6th of February, and they had no history of travel. Now, if there's no history of travel, this means that it was almost certainly a community spread condition. And that means they almost certainly caught it weeks before that. So they probably caught it round about mid-early January. That means they were incubating perhaps back into December. So it means there's been COVID-19 present in the United States, certainly in California. And this is way before the cases in Washington State round about Seattle. So it looks like this has been circulating in the United States for longer than had been thought. So Californian authorities now want to do check back into December, pushing it right back into December because they now suspect that some deaths that had been attributed to influenza in December were actually attributable to, in reality, COVID-19. And this would explain why there's been such a, a large number of the cases in the United States, both in terms of growth and in terms of the large number that have been uh, identified by testing because it's probably been circulating for much longer. So almost certainly this means there was community spread in January. That's really what that means. And perhaps early January as well. So um, interesting. It kind of makes sense of what we're, more sense of what we're seeing now, I think. Uh, now, Los Angeles County, as of today, the, the cases are still rising, unfortunately. Hospitalizations and intensive care admissions are still rising. Now, hopefully the number of new cases are down, but of course we have this lag from new cases, then a lag to hospitalization, then a lag to admission to intensive care very often, then a lag to death, or the number of deaths. So that what this means is, even if we're taking Los Angeles County as an example, even although the number of uh, new cases might be down, unfortunately with hospitalizations rising, we can expect to see... Um, deaths rising for the next few weeks, unfortunately, because of this lag effect. Now, um, two cats, two domestic cats have tested positive in two separate areas of New York State. So and it looks like, uh, now one of these families, one of the cat owners were, did have the disease, one didn't. So it looks like one of the cats uh, picked the COVID-19 up in the house and one of the cats picked it up outside the house. So cats uh, can get this infection, but we knew that already from antibody studies carried out in Wuhan, where quite a lot of the Wuhan cats were actually infected. And eight lions and tigers in the Bronx have been uh, infected as well. Now, the, the animals don't seem very well, and I think the cats have both recovered. And the consensus of veterinary and medical opinion seems to be at the moment that cats are not spreading it to humans, but cats have caught it from humans. So I think that what this means, if, if you are sick, um, and I haven't got too much data on dogs, but I think there has been one dog died of COVID-19. So if you are sick, then um, really you kind of need to isolate your, your animals as well, cats and dogs, but probably especially cats. Now, Georgia has been in the news for its um, <coughs> controversial standing on reopening. Now, at the moment, Georgia's got 20,000 confirmed cases, 800 deaths, so... Still a big problem going on in, here in, in Georgia. 
And, and there hasn't been a two week decline as, as the central government has suggested there should be a two week decline in the number of new cases prior to reopening. Nevertheless, despite the absence of the criteria, despite not meeting the criteria, Georgia are planning a significant reopening in the next 48 hours. Um, now, they are saying people at work should wear masks, which is good, and gloves, which is good. That shifts time should be staggered so that people aren't all going to work at the same time and that people should be at least six feet apart. That's the minimum, of course. Two metres, six feet is the absolute minimum. Should really be a bit more than that if possible. So it looks like they are taking some precautions there, but um, there's no question this means there'll be increases in cases and increases in hospital admissions, and that will feed forward into more deaths. But this is a calculation that the governor of Georgia presumably is aware of. Now, President uh, Trump has said he strongly disagrees with this decision, which um, is encouraging. It needs longer, but uh, the state governors seem to have a lot of autonomy in, in the state, so that they're reopening. There's other places as well we could mention. Uh, I've just picked on Georgia. And the other one that came that struck, to, struck me was Las Vegas, where the mayor is, wants to reopen casinos. And uh, I saw a question on, on TV and someone said, how do you ensure social distancing in casinos? And she said, I don't know. I don't run a casino or words to that effect. So, yeah, there you go. Now, this is interesting, interesting and revealing. China official cases official deaths uh, we now know this is wrong and i'll show you why we know this is wrong uh, the the modern the up-to-date data in china those probably is probably accurate so uh, there was uh thursday there was 10 new cases wednesday there was 30 new cases so um that's encouraging new cases are way down despite this new epicenter that looked like it was developing in the uh in the north in the northwest of China near the Russian border. Uh, no deaths yesterday reported in China, which is good. Now, Li, Li Zhuha um, has reappeared. Now, you might not remember him. Uh, I've been looking out for him for a couple of months now. Um, he was an active citizen journalist in, in Wuhan and he in Hubei province, the epicenter of the, of the whole global pandemic. And he was warning the world uh, quite heroically through his citizen journalism about this. And uh, he's now reappeared and apparently had been carted off by the Chinese police who kept him in quarantine uh, for two months. But delighted to see you're back if you're watching. And, and uh, if not, hopefully someone will pass uh, our best wishes on to you, uh, as, as I'm sure most of the world population does. And I do hope you are able to resume your citizen journalism. Glad to see you're back in circulation. Now, <clears throat> why I'm being so definitive about the Chinese study. Uh, this is a publication from The Lancet. Tracking case numbers over time is important to establish the speed and the effectiveness of interventions. So that's the title of this journal. And as always, I'll give you the link to the study. Um, Hong Kong... Uh, uh, Health and Medical Research Fund Hong Kong, so a reputable science institution in Hong Kong, published this in The Lancet, a reputable medical journal. Now, what this is saying is if you track the number of cases over time, that tells you about how quickly cases are accelerating, the increase in spread in the pandemic. But it also tells you how, infect how effective your interventions are. So if you don't have this accurate data, then you don't know how quickly it's spreading and you don't know how your interventions are working. You have to have this data. And it turns out that very often the Chinese were not publishing this data for reasons we'll see. Now, um, so th th this reputable body in Hong Kong. Now, what, what they found was that the Chinese changed their definitions of cases as they went through. And this Hong Kong group found if the same case definition had been used throughout the pandemic, the numbers would have been very different, very different. And they reinforced this idea that the tracking case numbers over time is important to establish the speed of spread. You see, you need to be able to see your enemy. How quickly is the enemy spreading? Well, you only know that 
if you're able to track numbers accurately and also the effectiveness of your interventions. Now, this is what they came up with using, I must say, pretty sophisticated mathematical techniques. And I don't pretend to understand all of them, but I do accept their conclusions because it's in The Lancet and it's a peer reviewed uh, journal, a very reputable study. So as of the 20th of February, 2020, which is when the data went up to. Now, what they did was they took data from the World Health Organization visit to China and they took information from China and combined those. And their conclusion was that there was 232,000 cases in China as of the 20th of February, as opposed to the official number, which was 55,000. So a quick calculation there would tell us that the real numbers were four times higher than the official numbers. Now, we've suspected this all the way through. This confirms it. This confirms it. So the real numbers in China now, what have we just said they were? Um, I'm sure I've just said those, haven't I? Yeah. Have I? No, maybe I haven't. Anyway, never mind. Um, the, the real numbers in China now uh, are actually, the official numbers in China are actually still lower than that. And yet we know that the number was basically a quarter of a million back in the 20th, the 20th of February. So interesting, the Chinese numbers are, were underreported and are underreported according to this study, which uh, I fully uh, accept. Now the UK, um, increasing cases. Now the UK, this, the, these are deaths in hospital. So, this is not counting deaths in care facilities, which have been huge. Not counting deaths at home, which have been significant. So we can perhaps add 50% onto that death figure. Because um, that's the deaths in hospital. So, yeah, it's, it's, the deaths are well into the 20,000s in the UK. No question about that whatsoever. As we have suspected for some time on this channel from, uh, I think, First suspected it from talking to undertakers actually. Um, now at the moment we're testing 23,000 a day but there's 40,000 available so test logistics are being uh, improved and they're talking about mobile, uh, perhaps army run mobile testing centres to care facilities to get this up to the 40,000 tests available and we're still hoping to get it up to 100,000 tests by the end of April which is still looking challenging but it's still the aim. Now Personal protective equipment's interesting. We're using 16, 10 to 16 million items a day. So this is a huge amount of PPE being used. So we need this constant river of supply because it's all disposable, of course. Now, um, when I was a young staff nurse, we used uh, PPE and we used to send it to the laundry afterwards to get washed because hot soapy water will kill this virus. But it's all disposable these days. So part of the supply is the fact that it's all single use and you just need a constant supply of it it's a constant chain of it so um, that's part of the problem and the other thing that's concerning me about PPE is richer countries are all kind of buying it up meaning that there's very little available for poorer countries but we did see that people in Malawi are making their own which was good to see now <laughs> I, I, I don't I, I was trying to resist saying I told you so but I mean really I mean when this football match was on, I had one of my reliable sayings saying we need to move from reactivity to proactivity. I was saying that repeatedly during this time. And on the 11th of March, 3,000 football fans went from Madrid to Liverpool for a game of football. I mean, I'm saying this at the time. I was appalled at the time. Look back at the videos, you know. So this is ridiculous. We need to move from reactivity to proactivity. So because there wasn't that many cases around, they think, oh, we'll just have a game of football then. 54,000 people at the game, people travelling to watch Atletico Madrid, drinking in pubs in Liverpool. Normally Spanish people are more than welcome to drink in pubs in Liverpool, of course, but not at this time. Staying in hotels and B&Bs in Liverpool, which of course they're normally most welcome to do, but not at that time. 
not so much the spread in the crowd but more the social interactions that would be concerning um but at that time even the, the games in spain were played behind closed doors so it's not as if people didn't know about it then and i was ranting and raving about moving from reactivity to proactivity because our social distancing began on the 17th of march and then the 10th to the 13th of march we had these 200 quarter of a million people at the cheltenham gold cup festival now the reason i'm mentioning these is both of these are now being investigated because they do seem to have given rise to more cases in liverpool and more cases in the area around about cheltenham so real lack of proactivity there people have reacted now rather than being proactive before the cases started to spread well we did tell them sorry i shouldn't uh, shouldn't uh, say say that really but uh, it, it is it, it is annoying now that it was obvious at the time and it just wasn't done now on the good news on the good news oxford human vaccine trials have started i believe so in oxford uh, young healthy volunteers at the time of speaking i understand have already been given trial doses of a new oxford based vaccine and we all hope that it works it's not the end yet there's lots of trials still to do but it started so that's remarkably encouraging now new zealand the one of the world's great success stories um that many cases that many deaths now the penny seemed to drop in new zealand on the 13th to the 14th of march now to be fair they had a lot of other places to learn from because we've just looked at the uk dates there when we were starting to realize that it was about the right time to do something weren't we then when, when did we start in the uk so uh we started social distancing on the 17th on the 17th of march in the uk so 14, 15, 16, 17. So the, the, the New Zealanders were, were four days ahead in terms of uh, starting their isolation there. So that's good. But the, the penny seemed to drop because there was this tragic shooting, of course, in Christchurch the year before. And there was actually plans um, to have a memorial, rightly so, for, for, for this appalling uh, mass murder event that occurred in Christchurch on the 14th of March, 1919, presumably. And uh, the Prime Minister, uh, uh, is it Justina Arden, uh, on the 13th she said it was going ahead. And on the 14th she'd changed her mind and cancelled it. So the penny seemed to drop then. Uh, thank goodness it did. Because New Zealand is a success story. And so the testing across the country helps identify cases. So they've made the enemy visible. That's one thing they've done. They've managed clusters of cases and track how well the our efforts, this is from the New Zealand website, how well the efforts are working. So they're, they're tracking the efficacy of the interventions, which is what you need to do. There's ongoing surveillance testing of a wider population to make sure there's not undetected cases being carried out in parts of New Zealand. And uh, Justina Arden said, we're going hard and we're going early. So presumably this is because she changed her mind on the night of the 13th of March, which I'm delighted she did. Uh, we only have 102 cases, but so did Italy once. So that is an example of what you would call proactivity. So the R naught in New Zealand now is less than one. Fantastic. So each infected, I mean, the, the, the lots, so, so, so many things in, in um, New Zealand, the lockdown, the social isolation, the quarantining of uh, people coming into the country. Um, so that, so each infected person now in New Zealand on average is, is infecting well less than one. So the number of cases is going down. So excellent. And uh, I actually, we've been umming and ahhing about this on this channel for some time now, whether the disease could be uh, eliminated in New Zealand. And I, I'm actually hopeful that it could be. As long as they maintain very high levels of testing, I believe it could be eradicated in New Zealand, which would be simply wonderful. And as of the 28th of April, they started to move out of lockdown measures. So good news, good news in Australia. Moving from good news to bad news, um, Africa's got an increased number of cases throughout the continent, more than 24,000 now. Of course, the way numbers, the real numbers way higher than this. 1,100 deaths. Um, but again, the numbers will be higher than that. 
they're the reports from the World Health Organization. Now, Dr. Tedros said he believes that Africa is still at the beginning of its coronavirus outbreak. Well, again, we did say this uh, several months ago, and uh, we did confirm this uh, yesterday and the day before. So, But it's glad to see that it is being confirmed by the World Health Organization. So I'm not knocking it. It's official now that Africa is somewhere like this. That's the cases. That's time. So Africa is somewhere about here. And what's going to happen is this. No real question about that, I am afraid. It's at the beginning of its outbreak. And yesterday we looked at the other problems that go with this, such as hunger. So we definitely need coordinated action to help people in Africa who are going to be suffering from this in a, in a severe way. I, it's not that I fear, I'm certain about it, unfortunately. Now, Spain, number of deaths. Um, um, so 440 deaths on Thursday. 435 the day before so slight increase but overall the trend is downwards it is starting to trend downwards now so that's good but still t over 22,000 deaths in Spain new cases still more new cases but again the number of new cases is down but I must say disappointing number of new cases given how draconian the Spanish lockdown has been disappointing um, Germany um, new cases so Germany up to now 148,000 cases. Deaths in Germany uh, are, are increasing as well um, to a fairly typical European percentage, actually, now it has to be said. Russia. Um, been concerned about Russia for a long time, but the Russians are now reporting the third day of reductions. They're now reporting the third day of reductions which of course is good news if it's true. New cases, total number of cases, new deaths, total number of deaths. Let's hope this is accurate reporting and that the number of cases in Russia are in fact going down, although I am fearful. Afghanistan's had the biggest daily rise. I mean, the numbers aren't huge, but the testing's not good. So basically we can say that the situation in Afghanistan is deteriorating. Now, I found this fascinating article here on um, children, but I think I'll give you that in a separate video. I've gone on for a while. Now, next job today is to apologise to every single person in Australia. Uh, firstly, I didn't realise that uh, uh, ACT was Australian Capital Territories, quite inexcusable. Um, but let's look at the Australian website now. And I did say yesterday that the Australians have got this beautiful easy to follow website but i still managed to mess it up so we'll try and get it right today and um i do hope the people of australia accept my apologies so this is the various areas so western australia with the number and cases northern territories uh, south australia up in queensland most cases as we would expect in in new south wales um because of the conurbation areas in new south wales uh, Australian Capital Territories, there, 104. Uh, Victoria, um, 16 deaths, 1,337 cases, and um, yeah, and fewer cases in Tassie, which is, is good. So it's, it's nice that they give that really clear map there. So um, I wish every country did one like this, actually. This, this is all on one single side of A4. So this is the current cases in Australia, total cases, total deaths cases recovered and these are the different regions that we've just mentioned. Now this is a very encouraging graph the number of daily recorded new cases. So we know the total number of cases will be going up but since well what, since when 27th of March 24th of March number of new cases have been going down quite dramatically. So 23rd of April uh, today very few new cases slightly more than yesterday but look at this very nice downward trend so very encouraging there for Australia now this graphic is the um, the amount of cases in hospital 
Uh, this is current cases in intensive care in, in all of Australia, and this is the current cases in hospital. So again, encouragingly low numbers of critical cases and cases in hospitals um, in Australia. All very encouraging. Cases by sources of infection. Now, this gives us the reason why the Australians are doing so well, because most of the cases are still from, um, this is from overseas acquired. So they've managed to absolutely minimise locally acquired transmissions in Australia. And uh, even smaller numbers with the contact not identified. So that shows why, one reason why there's been um, less spread in Australia than many other countries in the world. Now this is the one I completely hashed up yesterday, so my unreserved apologies for that. Cases by age, group and sex. So these are the number of cases. So as we would expect, the identified cases are roughly the same in males and females at various ages. Because we know that men and women, boys and girls, all get infected equally. It's how severe they manifest the disease. That is the differentiating factor. And this is deaths by age group and sex. So thankfully we see no deaths in the younger age group, which is, is excellent. But in most age groups here, we see more men than women. Men, women, men, women dying. Now, there's, it's different in the over 90 age group. Here we see more women dying than men. Now, the reason for this is that in this older age group, a lot of the men have already died because there's more old women demographically than old men demographically. So there's more of them left to die. So the men dying there are less because the men, men have already died uh, 10, 20 years ago of something else. So that's, uh, that makes sense of that. So that one's cases, that one's deaths. Uh, testing also going very well in Australia. You can look at that. But um, half a million tests nearly performed now. 1.4 tests were positive. Now this is from, I think this is from Vincent in San Francisco. So good to see these posters in the on the lamp posts advising people to wear masks. Uh, so everyone must wear a face covering, which I'm pleased to say, and stay at least six feet apart. And the reason for wearing masks uh, is from Andrea, is to keep please keep your droplets out of my mucous membranes. So that is the reason for wearing masks. That's why we want to wear masks. It, it is to stop me as an infected person putting my droplets into your mucous membranes or if you're infected and don't know about it it means you don't put your droplets into my mucous membranes which is the way that we want it this is why we're currently advocating universal wearing of masks in public transport and in uh, supermarkets let's hope my government is listening